Today on the Joel Klatt Show, we've got actual games to talk about. Let's talk about the New Year's Six and the Holiday Bowl. College football has never been better. Interest has never been higher. I believe that we are at the dawn of the golden age of college football. It was an epic day of college football. It was one of those days where you fall in love with the sport all over again. Welcome into the program. I'm Joel Klatt. This show is presented by Hampton by Hilton. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Um, I know we did. Uh, my boys absolutely loved it. Um, we are getting you all set for these New Year's Six Bowl games today, including the Holiday Bowl, which I'll call um, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evening on Fox. Uh, that one, Louisville and USC. We'll get into that one. We'll get into all of these games. Now, uh, full disclosure, we are recording this just before um, these games, and so we don't know all of the potential opt-outs. So big disclaimer here at the start of the show. Um, from an opt-out perspective in terms of who's playing in these games and who is not playing in these games. We do have some of these guys that have declared one way or another, but not all of them who are going to be a factor, so we'll see. Um, just remember, as we start heading into a new year, you're going to want to follow the podcast. So subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this, and uh, make sure to rate, review us where you get your podcast. Leave a comment below. Uh, and, and like the channel there on YouTube. You can follow us on social media, wherever you like the social media. You can keep up with, uh, uh, up with us all off season long as we will finish out this season. We'll get into the draft. We'll do a lot of great stuff in the off season. So you're going to want to follow us on social media at Joel Klatt Show. You can follow me personally at Joel Klatt on Twitter. Let's get into some of these uh, games here. And we do have some intriguing games. And, and, I, and I will say, is it like it used to be? No. And and is it sad in some respects? Yes. Yes, obviously. I would love to go back to, and I talked about this on, on a previous show, I would love to go back to that model of, of just like New Year's Day was the best possible day for a college football fan and a family that loves football just period. I can remember, as I've said before, I grew up in Arvada, Colorado. And my dad was a high school football coach. My brother is six years older than, than I was. And, and we just loved watching sports. And, and you know, we had this, this area in the basement where it was kind of like our main TV area. But what we did on New Year's Day is we had, I believe it was just two other TVs in the entire house. There was a little black and white TV that we had in one of the rooms. And then there was a, a, a television in my parents' room. Okay, and, and that was it. But we would move them into that room so we would have the three screens. It was like the man cave before the man cave. And we would set it all up there, and the main TV would have the sound, but the other two TV, TVs would be on, and we'd start watching games. And and I, we would have breakfast, and then all of a sudden it would be like the, the lunch would be out, and there would be wings, and there would be pizza and nachos and seven-layer dip. It was the best. I can remember being a kid and thinking that that was the best day of the year. Um, I would go outside and we would play football for an hour or two, and then we'd come back in and, and sure enough, there would be more games on. Um, and full disclosure, one of my favorite players at the time was Deion Sanders. And so what I used to do was take my mom's dish towels off the oven and like put them in my waist as if I had the towel like hanging down and I would run around outside. It, I mean, New Year's Day was incredible. So is it like that? No. But is it still intriguing? Yes. A lot of these games have so much intrigue, and in particular with what they are going to mean for these programs moving into next season. Because what ends up happening now, more so than in, in previous years, or certainly in the past, is that these games now fall into this mode of like you're building for the future and trying to wrap up what has been, in a lot of these cases, a successful season. And so there's there's this like middle ground of what this game means to these teams. And so we'll try to thread that middle ground here as we talk about these games here today. So let's get into it. I'm going to start with our game. Gus, Jenny, and I will be in San Diego for the Holiday Bowl, December 27th on Fox, Louisville, and USC. Louisville, by the way, favored by seven and a half at this point. And a lot of that... It, 
has to do with the fact that there's so much changing at USC. Um, as I'm preparing for this game, it's the most unique situation I've ever seen preparing for a game. And in a lot of ways, that's because it's it's we've never seen this in, in history, as I was just talking about. But man, like I have no idea who's going to be on the field for USC. Which is which is wild. There's a lot of change happening right now. Obviously, Caleb Williams, Marshawn Lloyd, Brendan Rice not expected to play in this one. Taj Taj Washington led the team in catches and yards. He may not play either as he's declared for the draft. Both sides of the ball have been hit by a number of players entering the portal, including some guys that raised eyebrows. Tackett Curtis being one of those guys, a linebacker. Um, so like again, a, a lot going on. <laughs> At USC. And this is a team that a lot of us thought, or at least a lot of people thought, had the ability, the talent level, and, and in particular the quarterback, to go and compete at the highest end of the sport this season. They started 6-0. and They were number five in the country, and then they, they lost five of the last six games. Defense allowed 210, 210 rushing yards per game over the last six. In a lot of ways, it wasn't necessarily Caleb's fault or Lincoln Riley's fault, although he's the head coach and is going to bear the brunt of this. But, man, that defense was so bad. And it was it was their only objective last year in the offseason. Improve the defense. Just be okay on defense. They didn't have to be great. And I've said this I don't know how many times over the years. They don't have to be great. They just had to be decent. And they couldn't do it. They could not stop the run. They couldn't stop Washington in that game when the Huskies came down. And, and won in the Coliseum. They couldn't stop Utah in that game. Uh, they played one of the more difficult schedules in the country, there's no doubt. And and I don't envy... Well, let's just put it this way. like the Nine straight consecutive weeks against Power 5 opponents just doesn't happen in college football. That's what USC had to face. And yet, there was still a, a, a level of ineptitude on defense that was so vastly frustrating for that fan base and trust me, I, I hear it, and I, and I know a lot of those, those people. Over the last eight games of the season, USC allowed over 42 points per game, dead last in the country. I mean, come on. that. So, Alex Grinch out. New defensive coordinator in, Lincoln Riley. He is 51, 50 and 1 in his career as a head coach when his team holds the opponents under 30 points. So, again, don't have to be great. Just have to be okay. Louisville, on the meantime, had a great first season under Jeff Brom. Jeff Brom at Purdue goes to the Big Ten Championship game. Then all of a sudden, Satterfield leaves Louisville, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I can go home. This is a perfect time for me to go home. Achieved kind of what you would hope to achieve at Purdue. They got to the Big Ten Championship game. Did what they what the objective was in a lot of ways. And then he goes home to Louisville, and boy, they struck it right away. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he did go home. And so I think it was easier, easier for him to get that team and the players on that team on board as a first-year coach because he was going back to Louisville. And this is a team that, in a lot of ways, overperformed. I think on defense, you, it's easy to say that. I think that the 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 sum is probably greater than the parts on defense for Louisville. And then they had some things work in their favor. A big credit has to go to Jeff Brom and his, uh, his entire staff because they located what their players could do. So they get Jack Plummer, who they were familiar with from his days at, at, at Purdue. Then Plummer went to Cal and then obviously to Louisville. And so they were familiar with him, and they realized, like, okay, we're probably not going to be a 60% pass team like we were with Aiden O'Connell at Purdue. So let's change that up a little bit. What, what should we be? Well, let's be more of a run team. That's what Jack Plummer can do. That's what uh, our offensive line is going to be decent. That's what Satterfield de did. Let's, let's get in there. So uh, Jawar Jordan and Jamari Branch, both of these guys on the outside and skilled position at, at running back, they were tremendous offensively, and they're not going to play in this game. So both Jordan and Branch uh, not playing in this game, which is a bummer. Although, I can't wait to see, like, well, what do you have behind it? You know, Louisville has done a nice job in the transfer portal. They did a really nice job last year. They're starting to do a good job this year. And, and th this is a team that I think it, 
in that vein of finishing out a great year and building towards the next year, this is a bit of both for them. Ashton Gelati is their best player on defense. He was second in the voting for ACC Defensive Player of the Year. He had 11 sacks on the season. That that led the conference. And he's going against a USC offensive line that really struggled at times protecting Caleb Williams. And now they're going to be protecting Miller Moss. And Miller Moss is making his first start for USC. I'm interested to see what that looks like. You know, I mean, again, USC, I don't want to say they're a mess right now, but it's just like, boy, there's a lot of moving pieces with USC. Um, transfers out, transfers in, what are they going to look like a, a, a year from now? Can they fix the defense? Will they be as good on offense? Is Miller Moss a guy that can compete for and win the job next year? You know, this is a great audition right there. This is a great audition, and that'll take place in San Diego. That's the Holiday Bowl uh, on Wednesday, December 27th, live on Fox. Um, that one is at 8 p.m. Eastern. Bowl season, in a lot of ways, is my favorite time of year, along with the the rest of the college football uh, season. And as you know, I take it seriously. So when I'm traveling on the road to watch my favorite teams, I can't risk calling the wrong play with where I stay. So wherever I go, I know that I can count on Hampton by Hilton. I can depend on their comfortable rooms and their warm and friendly service. Their free hot breakfast, total game changer for me. So whether you're cheering on your team from the stands or never leaving the tailgate, Hampton by Hilton will always give you that win. Let's get into some of these New Year's Six games. I'm going to start with the Cotton Bowl. That one's going to be on Friday, December 29th, Missouri, Ohio State. Big movement in line in this one. Uh, a lot of that having to do with the Kyle McCord news during the course of this uh, portal season as McCord left Ohio State. It, it started Ohio State favored by six and a half, and now it's Mizzou. Two and a half. Wild swing in line. Wild swing in line. So you know that the money just poured in, not just a little bit, not just trickled in, but poured in for Mizzou to move it all the way to Mizzou two and a half. Now, as of now, there haven't been like the major opt-outs from Ohio State. Marvin Harrison Jr., Travion Henderson, they have not declared for the NFL draft, and they have not opted out of this game. So there, uh, several of the other draft-eligible players have confirmed that they will play in this game, like uh, wide receiver Emeka Abuka, Denzel Burke, uh, the corner, Jack Sawyer, defensive end, Donovan Jackson, their uh, offensive guard, Tyleek Williams on the defensive side. Notable portal players, though, for Ohio State that will not be in this game, McCord, obviously, Chip Trainum, who was kind of the backup back to Travion Henderson, and Julian Fleming, former number one wide receiver in the country that came in and just never really materialized. Um, so it'll be interesting, you know, what happens for them with the players that are replacing those guys. That's going to fall on Devin Brown, the quarterback, who talk about an, an amazing opportunity, very similar to Miller Moss, right? Like this is a great opportunity for Devin Brown to kind of showcase and state a case, if you will, of why he should be the Buckeyes' starting quarterback next year. A little bit different than USC in that I don't feel like Ohio State is as aggressive in the quarterback market and the portal as what it seems to, as as what USC seemed to be in the portal. So it leads you to believe that Ryan Day is at least comfortable with. Devin Brown starting this game, moving into the offseason, and competing with Lincoln Kleinholz, the freshman, and Aaron Nolan, the high school recruit that's about to be there in the spring in Columbus. It could be a decision between those three. Now, it may not be because the portal will remain open, and there's always going to be that two-week uh, portal opening right after spring football. So you never know who might lose a quarterback battle throughout the country and then get into the portal after spring. And depending on what happens during the course of spring football and the way that those three players play under Ryan Day, you may see a situation where Ohio State brings somebody in after spring football. That could be the case. It happened at uh, uh, Alabama last year, if you remember. So now... 
Devin Brown in this game, getting back to the Cotton Bowl, Devin Brown going to go out there and, and he gets to start. So this is an incredible opportunity for him. It's also an incredible opportunity for like wide receiver Carnell Tate, who is a guy that everybody raves about in that program. They all talk about Carnell Tate being the next great Buckeye wide receiver. And they've recruited unbelievable at that position. You talk about just like year in and year out getting – you know, two or three of the best wide receivers in high school recruiting. And guess what? Carnell Tate is one of those guys. I'll be interested to see, like, if Travion plays at running back, like, obviously, that's that's good for them. But if he doesn't, or even if he does and they want to work in, you know, some depth at that position, you might see a lot more of Dallin Hayden. And that's a guy that Buckeye fans have really liked for a long time and wondered why he doesn't get more opportunities. Well, we might see him get that opportunity here in the Cotton Bowl. Uh, Ryan Day coming off that third straight loss to Michigan and only his seventh total loss in his five years as the Buckeyes head coach. It has been interesting because going into that game, didn't you didn't you sense and feel like there was a lot of pressure on Ryan Day and that if he lost to an acting head coach in Sharon Moore, if he lost his third straight to, to Michigan, that there were going to be, like the claws would be out with Buckeye fans. And I'm not suggesting that they weren't. And I'm not suggesting that this was all like unicorns and rainbows in Columbus. But I didn't sense that the fan base was as adamant about like, you know, Ryan and and wanting to move on as they that as I maybe anticipated them being. Now, maybe a lot of that vitriol and criticism fell towards Kyle McCord. Uh, because of the interception in that game and and just the overall feeling that that he wasn't he wasn't up to par against Michigan. Maybe that's the case. And maybe that's one of the reasons why he's at Syracuse. But Ryan Day, seventh loss in his fifth year as the Buckeyes head coach. Winning this one could help in a lot of ways this offseason. You don't want to lose this one, but obviously, like it's so different than the playoff game a year ago. You don't want the same feeling. As as losing to Michigan and then losing the play uh, the playoff last year and then like a bowl game this year, so now they're facing a Mizzou team and this Mizzou team, by the way, man, they had a great season. Mizzou was terrific in a lot of ways. They're coming off a great ten win season. It's only losses LSU and Georgia, trying to finish in the top ten for the first time in basically a decade. They won the Cotton Bowl this game in 2013 under Gary Pinkle. Love Gary Pinkle, by the way. Um, and and this is a team, by the way, that like I I really like the way they're built offensively because they've got a good bit of balance, and and they found that with a former walk on Cody Schrader. Cody was tremendous. He averaged nearly 200 yards from scrimmage over his last five games, so he 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 was really good late in the season. Um, he was a finalist for the Doak the Doak Walker Award, and he won the Bullsworth Trophy for the nation's best former walk-on. Schrader averaged 124 yards rushing per game this season. That was second only to Ollie Gordon, who was the nation's leading rusher at Oklahoma State. So love what Schrader did. And he, in so many ways, had a big finish to the season because of what Brady Cook and Luther Burden was, was doing early in the season, which is dominating in the passing game. And yeah, they've got the the nation's second leading rusher per game in Schrader, and yet Cook threw for over 3,000 yards, and Luther Burden has nearly 1,200 yards receiving. So there's a lot of threats out there for Missouri on the offensive side. They can throw it around, they can run it, and that's going to be difficult for Ohio State. If Ohio State's not ready to go, Missouri can absolutely win this game, and that's where the line has gone. Missouri now favored by two and a half. Now, if you get a, a fully engaged Ohio State team, even with Devin Brown at quarterback, I think that that's a better team than Missouri. But who knows what type of engagement you're going to get? We still don't know about Marvin Harrison. We still don't know about Travion Henderson. I just don't, I don't see a scenario in which Ohio State can lose their quarterback, their best running back, and Marvin Harrison Jr., their best wide receiver, and go out there and beat a team as good as Missouri has been in their 10 wins with a balanced offense with Schrader, Cook, and Burden. So a lot of this depends on the decision for Marvin Harrison and Travion Henderson. 
Can't really make a pick without those guys' uh, uh, decisions yet. Okay, Peach Bowl. This one's on Saturday, December 30th. Penn State and Ole Miss. Okay, so when I was looking at this game, I immediately thought to myself, you know, this, this game kind of feels like it could be a first-round game next year in 2024. In a lot of ways, with, with the way that these two teams have recruited and set themselves up for next season specifically, not going to shock me if both of these teams are in the college football playoff as we expand to 12. I could see this being a matchup in the first round next year. There's no doubt. Now, Penn State is going to be favored in this one by three and a half. So the only real opt-out from the Penn State side is Chop Robinson. And that's that's a big one because Chop is a fantastic defensive end. Uh, but several of the other leaders on that team, including even ones that have declared for the draft already, have stated that they will play and want to finish this season the right way and, and all the way through. They did lose their defensive coordinator, Manny Diaz. Not going to be on the sidelines for Penn State. He took the head job at Duke. Um, his two years were highly successful with that defense. That defense was one of the best defenses in America. Now, they have made a defensive coordinator higher, or at least it's expected to be Tom Allen um, at the time that we record this. Tom Allen, the former head coach at Indiana, is expected to be the defensive coordinator at Penn State moving forward. He's got ties, by the way, down to Ole Miss. He was the linebacker coach at Ole Miss about a decade ago. This is a really good defense, even without Chop Robinson. They were number one in total yards allowed. They were number one in yards per play allowed. They were number three in scoring defense. They were number one in sacks per game at almost four per game. Like, this is a really good team. A really good team on that side of the ball. And, and what we know is that they just struggled on offense. Penn State struggled on the offensive side. Now, they have made a change with their offensive coordinator, and they'll have a new offensive coordinator next season. And I, I really like uh, Andy Colt uh, Nick, Nicky. Man, pronunciations are not my strong suit, in particular uh, early in the morning when we're recording this. He came from Kansas. That Kansas offense was was one that was, oh, what's, what's the word I'm trying to, to find? I mean, it was the envy of a lot of people in college football. Kansas had done a remarkable job over the last couple of years, and Lance Leipold got a lot of the credit, but offensively, they did some really special things. So Penn State's going to dip into that Kansas offense for their new offensive coordinator. A win would give Franklin his fifth season with 11 wins in his 10-year tenure. Ole Miss, by the way, has never won 11 games in program history, so a lot on the line for the Lane train as Lane Kiffin has had a hot portal season no one's doing a better job in the portal than Lane Kiffin. And Penn State, they're a team that as 0-4 against Michigan and Ohio State the last two years is 21-0 against everybody else. So, again, I, I love this. And, and, and Kiffin has built his team through portal and recruiting to be really good next year. James Franklin had one of the best sophomore classes in America this last year on his team. They're still going to be there. Like, you know, like this, again, could be a playoff game next year. Ole Miss is interesting. They won 10 games, but they lost by 14 to Bama um, the week after Bama almost lost to South Florida. That was before Bama really got rolling. They got beat by 35 at Georgia in November. They were 4-0 in one-score games. You know, there's, there's a lot to like about what Lane did at Ole Miss, and then, like, that Georgia game is just a bit alarming. Quinshawn Junkins... He didn't rush for the 1,500 yards that, that he did as a freshman, but he did get better as the season went along as, and as he got more healthy, and I think that was the big thing for him. He had 100 yards in five of his last eight games. That's going to help them, and, and Lane wants to run the ball as much as he likes to throw it around. He, he wants to and needs to run the ball. Jackson Dart now has a couple of seasons starting under Kiffin. Um, he is coming back for his senior year. That's great for them. They look like a team that, at least on paper, with what they did in the portal being one of, if not the best recruiting class out of the portal. They've done a nice job in NIL. They've done a nice job with their collective. Obviously, Lane is a very good coach. They could be a trendy pick next year in the SEC to finish in that you know, second, third, fourth realm, which would certainly make them kind of a playoff caliber team. This is, like I said, a game that I think that we could see next year. Uh, Penn State is favored by three and a half. 
I'm going to go with Penn State because that defense, I think, is going to do a nice job against uh, Junkins. But I think that could be a close game. So that's the Peach Bowl. Orange Bowl, Saturday, December 30th, Florida State and Georgia. So Georgia's favored by 14. And a lot of this has to do with just like, what are we going to get from each of these teams? Are they still bummed out about being left out of the college football playoff? Are they going to be engaged and want to win this game? What's it going to be? Is it the springboard for next season? Or is it the disappointment of this season? Because both of these teams are disappointed that they're not in the college football playoff. What's the reaction going to be? Got the Seminoles, got the Bulldogs. Um, I look at this and and what I hope doesn't happen in this game is that I, I hope that this game doesn't create a narrative around Florida State like, see, we knew they, they were not good. Listen, Florida State with Jordan Travis was a damn good football team. Now, they had some flaws like all the teams this year. There were a lot of good teams. I had my doubts about Florida State during the course of the year. You know, the game against Boston College, the game against Clemson. You know, there, there were times when I thought, boy, the, these other teams have them dead to rights. And after the injury, I thought to myself, ah, I don't know if they're going to be able to pull this off. And they did. And I get it that they are incredibly frustrated. And in so many ways, yes, they got screwed. Did the committee get it right? No, I don't think there was a right answer. You know, so I feel bad for Florida State, but we have a better playoff because they're not in the playoff. I think both of those those things can be true. And as in so many cases, two things can be true at once. Um, Florida State has won 19 straight games. They have struggled mightily on offense without Jordan Travis, right? They managed, what, 224 yards a couple weeks ago, 219 total yards. Those are the two games since Jordan Travis got hurt. But their defense is outstanding. Third in the country in sacks with 45. Um, that's really what's kept the undefeated season alive. Their red zone defense, specifically against Louisville in the ACC championship game, is the reason why they even had a chance at the playoff in the first place. So that defense, um, they were fantastic. Jared Verse was a monster down the stretch. Now, Florida State's got a bunch of opt opt-outs. Trey Benson, the running back. Johnny Wilson, the wide receiver. Jaheim Bell, the tight end. They've all declared for the draft, and they've opted out. And that's on the offensive side, which was struggling anyways without their quarterback, Jordan Travis. I just don't see how Florida State, even if they're engaged, moves the ball against Georgia. Because even if Georgia is not engaged, they have recruited so well over the last four and five years that their depth and their youth are incredible. So I look at this and I'm like, I know that Georgia doesn't have the elite defense that they've had over the previous couple of years, but man, they're facing an offense that is not really going to be able to move the ball, at least on paper. So it comes down to the offensive side. Beck plays. Will Bowers play? Will McConkey play? Not sure. If they do, then this is going to be heavy Georgia. Heavy Georgia. If they don't, it'll be lighter Georgia. I think Georgia wins this game. This feels like a game in which there could be more opt-outs coming. So we'll have to keep our eye on that. Georgia's favored by 14. Wouldn't surprise me if they covered that 14, in particular if Bowers and McConkey decide to finish this thing out and, and go ahead and play in this game. But we'll see. Like I said, this is a game that, to me, screams that we could have more opt-outs. Fiesta Bowl on the first. Uh, we've got Oregon and Liberty. Oregon is favored by 17 and a half. Uh, it'll feature two of the top five scoring offenses in the country. Oregon's number two in the country at 44 per game. Liberty, number five in the country at 41 points per game. Bo Nix has said that he will play. This will be his 61st start. 61st start in college football. That's quite remarkable. And by the way, Bo, great career. Great career, and I'm glad that you're going to finish it on the field on your terms. Um, their great wide receiver, Troy Franklin, and their center, Jackson Powers Johnson, they have declared for the draft and opted out of the game. Bucky Irving has also declared for the draft, but he says he intends to go ahead and play in the game. On defense, their corner, Kyrie Jackson, he's opted out to prepare for the draft. So a lot going on with Oregon. Now, 
Oregon is also one of these teams that seems to have a lot of momentum going for next season. Okay. They get Dale, Dylan Gabriel in the transfer portal. They flipped um, a couple of transfers, one an offensive lineman from Colorado that was going to transfer to Colorado. They flipped him to Oregon. They seem to, uh, I believe, uh, have gotten Dante Moore, or at least it's reported that Dante Moore uh, is going to be an, an Oregon commit out of the transfer portal. Their high school recruiting classes have been outstanding. Their youth on the offensive and defensive um, too deep, and I went over this in a couple of episodes previous, is outstanding. Oregon is going to be a playoff team next year. I'm going to be shocked if Oregon's not in the 12-team playoff. Oregon is absolutely one of the top three teams in the Big Ten next year. No doubt about it. And by the way, you understand what that means. That means that either Michigan, Ohio State, or Penn State has to be number four in the Big Ten. I firmly believe that they are, of all the teams moving conferences, and, and maybe them and Texas um, with Sark and what he's doing, but of all the teams moving conferences, they seem to be the most set up for early success in their new conference because Dan Lanning has done an incredible job. This guy's energy, did they finish the right way? No. That Pac-12 game, I don't know what was going on. A lot of it was just quality play from Washington, and a lot of it was, to be honest, like not a great plan. And he admitted that to me, by the way. I saw him in Las Vegas, Dan Lanning, um, not for the game, but it was for the National Football Foundation College Football Hall of Fame um, induction dinner and and he was there along with almost everybody else and I and I was like hey man great season I'm sorry it didn't finish the way that you wanted and he was just like I didn't think we had a good plan he's like that was that was on us we need to do a better job of that I agree with that now I digress Oregon's looking towards next season and I think they could have a monster season and is this a springboard to that I think that they were hoping for a different matchup that's not a knock against Liberty because Liberty's had a phenomenal season, phenomenal season. And in a lot of ways, Jamie Chadwell is a guy that I think we should start looking at as, as a guy that should get a bigger job. I mean, and, and again, maybe he wants to just stay at Liberty. And if he does, then good for him, and he should. And I'm not trying to peel him away from, from Liberty, but to me, he feels like a Kalen DeBoer. He feels like a Lance Leipold. He's had a ton of success everywhere where he's been. This is his, his first season at Liberty. He's got a perfect record. He's now 44-6 and six over his last four seasons, his last three at Coastal, plus this season. It's like he just wins. And if we've learned anything from this year and Washington and Kalen DeBoer, it's like you want to have coaches that have done it before and that they just know how to win. Think of Leipold at Kansas. Think of Kleiman at Kansas State. These types of coaches, I think, have a lot of value, in particular in an era where I think guys get jobs way too early based on coordinator success, and we don't know if they're actually good head coaches. Why not hire somebody that's actually been a really good quality head coach and has won football games? And to me, that's Jamie Chadwell. Liberty, they're led by their quarterback, Caden Salter. He's been really good. Started his career at Tennessee. Um had some bumps in the road. Now it's his third year at Liberty. Dual threat guy, 43 total touchdowns, was the Conference USA Player of the Year. They lead the country in rushing, by the way. So Oregon is going to have to buckle it up on the defensive side. They ran it for over 300 yards per game. They're running back, Quentin Cooley, um, really good player. And when you combine him with Salter, their dual threat QB, th that one-two punch was one and two in rushing in Conference USA, both over 1,000 yards. I think them being able to run the football and keep Bo Nix off the field in a lot of ways is exactly what Washington did in the Pac-12 championship game, in particular in that first and early second quarter. So that's a blueprint that Liberty could follow, in particular being a 17-and-a-half-point dog. That Oregon rush defense, they gave up 157 on the grand ground to Washington, uh, but they are still a top 15-ranked rush defense in the country. One concern for Liberty, though, their pass defense, not very good. In fact, they're 103rd in the country, and they're going to be facing a Bo Nix-led offense that you know is going to be efficient. And even without Troy Franklin, they're going to have enough weapons out there through their recruiting, through their youth, through that, that deep talent pool, that with a guy like Nix pulling the strings, they should be just fine on offense. So I like Oregon in that one 
um, and potentially big, although I think Liberty and that run game could slow the game down, limit possessions, and they might have a good chance to cover that 17 and a half number. Um, that'll be a fun game to watch. I wish that I was watching it back in my basement with my brother and my dad with some hot wings and some nachos. And if you get an opportunity to do that on New Year's Day or any one of these days, do it because that's some of the best memories of my life. And what do I always say about college football? It's better when we share it together because college football is amazing. That'll do it for today's show. Uh, we'll be back Thursday with our playoff preview episode of the Joel Class Show. So come back on Thursday. That'll be uh, right after the Cotton Bowl. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll record that right before, or not the Cotton Bowl, I'm sorry. The Holiday Bowl, excuse me. Um, Holiday Bowl Wednesday night. New episode of Joel Class Show on Thursday morning, and that'll be the playoff preview as we get set for the college football playoff. Um, follow us on social media at Joel Clad Show. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. Make sure to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and have a wonderful holiday Christmas weekend.